Oh, good morning, everyone. I was all prepared to say happy Tuesday and what a beautiful day. And I did wake up to a very beautiful day, but it's not quite so beautiful anymore. But I thank you all for being here. There's so many names on that participant list that I recall and that I know from my interactions with you. So it's nice, nice to have you here today with us. Um, right in the picture below me, you see Cheryl Martin. And she is the regional facilitator for NYCCP. And those of you who have joined us for the third region, which is the Hudson River region, you, you would know Cheryl. She has conducted, um, so far, our two regional in-person face-to-face sessions. And we've asked her to come back and join us here today because we had a handful of people who really just couldn't, couldn't make our face-to-face -face session. And so we we're asking you to join us here today so that we could go over the wonderful material that we have for you. And also, um, it's archived. So your, your co-workers, your, your other managers that you work with who haven't been able to take it live and ha are not taking it today, now, it will be archived on the LMS system. So please make sure to let them know um, to view it there as soon as they possibly can. So our challenge today, actually, is to turn a wonderful in-person learning session that we had with supervisors all around the state to turn that into a webinar. And that's a little challenging because in, in person, obviously, there's a lot of interaction, there's experiential learning, and there's, there's learning from your peers as well. And so we want to try to input some of that dynamic with us today. So you're going to see um, a chat box that should be right down in the center of the screen. And then right next to that is a resource file. And these are just documents that over the last three content areas, the three webinars and all the learning collaborative surrounding them, um, that you should have. And I want to point out one particular file, and that is all in caps, so it should be easy for you to see. It's called Supervisor Resource Directory. And what the, in the supervisors who have been attending our in-person learning sessions really would like a way, and we think it's a wonderful idea, they'd like a way to be able to communicate with each other and to really, outside of the CMTI initiative, initiative, just to get together with peers across the state and understand how they're doing the work and to share how they're doing it so we can all um, relate and, and work with each other. So I'm asking you, if you could fill that out, the supervisor resource directory, you would have to print it out, fill it out, and then um, email it to me. If you, if you want to take a picture, that's fine. Scan it in if you have that ability that's fine as well. And if you don't have that ability, there might be a way just for you to fill it out using the Word document and then just emailing it directly to me. And so my email address is at the end of this presentation, but I'll just say it right here. It's RuthCW at NYAPRS.org. And now I'm going to transfer today's learning to Cheryl. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you very much, and welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for giving us this time this morning. We know how busy you are. And this can only work with the expertise that you bring to it. You are the experts about what's going on out there, uh, how your job as supervisor is functioning for you. So we look forward to hearing all of that. Um, we're going to move those resource files in a second, but right now I just kind of want to go over them so that you have an idea of what's going to be in there. Uh, most of them are regarding either when we're talking about SCARF or we're talking about the cultural activation, and I will be referring to them when we get there. So if you can have them ready or at least have a way to be able to view them, that would be really helpful. So, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to move the first slide forward, but I'm actually not going to um, begin with the questions that I have on there, I'd like to ask you something um, that I can have an understanding of where you are today as a supervisor and what really matters to you, what's really, really important. So if I were to ask you the question of what's most important to you in your role as supervisor, uh, what, what do you want to accomplish, what do you see as your role? And if you could just put that in the chat box, I'd appreciate that. Each time I ask you to do this, I'll wait a minute or so to see what I get. Uh, we'll discuss it and uh, then move on to the next.
A number of people are typing. I'm looking forward to hearing what's important to you. So we're hearing from Margaret. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Margaret. Um, my care managers get the emotional support that they really need and deserve to be effective. And wow, um, that relational piece is so vital. Staff wellness, again, looking at the relationship um, that your staff have, their wellness so that they can give that service to the people they serve, and hopefully your own wellness in that process. You know, one of the things that we talk about at NIAPRA is often the collective that when we do trainings all around the United state is really wellness not just for the people that we work with, but wellness for us and, and how to prevent yes. staff burnout. And those are really, really time critical topics that we all need and, and especially care managers the job changing the way it does. Right. Yeah. Uh, to provide the tools and connections to resources for the clients so that the care managers can best serve them. So how do we help connect folks to these various um, services that they would benefit from, um, to be able to positively guide and educate staff in their day-to-day -day work. So that day-to-day -day coaching, that those short interactions, what can I do to uh, set up a dynamic for the folks to feel very supported and yet some gentle guidance that will help them move on in their day. I think we'll move on to the next question I have in my head, uh, although I, um, others may still be typing. Um, the other question is, so in thinking about this, staff wellness, uh, your own wellness, uh, having the tools and the ability to get the resources that clients are going to need, to be able to help guide and support your staff, what is it that you require? Require. What is it that you need to do as a supervisor? What's most important um, in the behaviors that you have? And I don't see anyone typing at this point, so it, does, does the question need to be clarified or what are folks thinking? Okay, Kathy is typing. What do supervisory relationships require to be effective? Two others are typing, so I'll wait a few minutes or a minute. Mm -hmm. Trust and respect. Trust and respect. Respect. You must give it. Quite a parallel process between how we work with the care managers and supervisors and how we would like to see them work with the people they serve, an understanding of the job and the challenges the employee is facing. Yeah, that kind of compassion 
um, but also that wisdom of what might be helpful, uh, how can you support them, how can you help them get through their day. Okay, great. Thank you so much for answering those. It gives us a, an idea of where to go. Now, can we move that box? Thank you so much. So we are going to be very interactive today as much as we can. Uh, obviously, in the face-to-face, -face, as Ruth already mentioned, um, the whole day was interactive exercises. So I, I do understand that it can be a bit frustrating when we're waiting for the typing in and, and that kind of delay. But unless we're interacting, I'm not getting your wisdom and your understanding and your expertise um, and it makes it more difficult for us to move in this. So I really appreciate the effort that you put into that and, and your activities that you're doing with this. So we hope to have a lot of opportunities that you'll learn from me and I'll learn from you. Today we're going to discuss the experience of supporting and guiding competencies of your health home care managers. So, so far, as you know, we've talked about all of the outreach, engagement, and retention um, issues that will be helpful for folks to be able to get out there, find folks, uh, connect with them, build those relationships, and have them stay in the care management. And then the understanding complex needs. Um, the, the fact that the folks that we're serving will have multiple issues, uh, including um, trauma histories, physical issues, mental health issues, addiction issues, and major social issues, things like homelessness, et cetera. And so we'll discuss the overall skills of supervision, including effective strategies, challenges, and best practices. And we'll be spending a lot of time in that. That's where we talk about different skills and, and how would you make that work with the folks that you serve? How are you doing that right now with your supervisees? So uh, just a review of the five competencies that, were, that are um, expected of our care managers, the outreach engagement retention we did in March of 2015, understanding complex needs was done in April, and as you see, we're moving ahead to the other areas coming forward. But that's where we were when we had our face-to-face. -face. So here's the next question. Um, I'm not going to focus on number one, how's your team doing? What I'd like to hear is what's going well with outreach and engagement? What is going well? And do you have a sense, rather of your retention rate, I'd like to ask you, do you have a sense of what's making it go well? What is it about what the care managers are doing that are helping this outreach and engagement really work? Um, could you answer that one first? Multiple folks are typing, so we'll give them a few minutes. Uh, April, um, ongoing contact attempts with home visits, so sounds like folks are hanging in there and continuing to make attempts to connect with others. Um, utilizing a team that performs outreach in off hours. Wow, um, working in the late evening days when it might be easier to locate folks. And these ideas are really helpful for all of us to think maybe that would work on my team. Um, in the North Country, access to the patient portal at the hospital and sending care managers to the hospital. And I see after, I'm not sure what the rest of that is. Okay, after clients admitted and explaining health home to them. So actually having that close relationship with the health care systems, the hospitals, and being able to build those 
those relationships with folks there so that you can connect with the individuals that you're serving while they're in the hospital and have that um, transition be as smooth as possible when they leave. Um, outreach workers are much, much more confident in their role. Uh, they know what to do and how to do it. So you're, they're feeling uh, very efficacious then. They're feeling like they have this down and they know how to make those Anybody else? Looks like we're just about done with that. So it sounds as if outreach and engagement uh, for many of you is going quite well. And part of that is their persistence, that they hang in and keep trying to connect. Part of it is their willingness to go outside of normal business hours and seek people when they're most likely to be available. And part of it is these strong relationships with health systems where you're invited in and to work together and to be able to help transition people to their homes. So if you could think of one thing that would be helpful for this to be even better for you as far as the, um, the retention and, and the access and the outreach, what would it be if there was one thing that you could have? And I don't see anyone typing at this point. Um, is there anything, are we to assume that you're feeling pretty confident about this and that for the majority of you, and I see we have, oh, somebody, well, it's ourselves. So um, that the majority of you are feeling pretty confident with this and finding that it's going very well. We now have 17 participants. We've heard from quite a few. Um, is there anybody that would, um, like to talk. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, because I would really love if people are comfortable to speak. We don't have that many that we couldn't do that. Is there anybody that would like to say anything about that, or you're feeling that that piece of it is pretty um, comfortable for folks, and as somebody mentioned, there's a lot of confidence within the care managers that that's happening and that things are going well. So having said that, for, um, the, for those of you who are feeling that things are going very well, what percentages of the folks that you're given do you find that you're able to connect with? Can you give me approximations of what percentages you are actually making that connection with eventually? You know, Cheryl, I just wanted to interrupt a moment. This is first again. I think what we're going to try yeah. to do is not really a very large audience, um, and we'd like to unmute everyone, so please know that we're unmuting all of your phones right now from our system. If there is background noise on your end, we would just ask that you unmute your, your phone directly from your line, but everyone from our end will be unmuted, and we really would like to see if we can have a very lively conversation. Sometimes it just takes too long to type. Yeah, I would love to have that. I'd much rather speak to a person than read typing. But Dan, I'll read yours because I see you're typing right now. So how are we doing? 60%, Dan says, for community referrals, uh, but percentage isn't as high for DH, DOH lists. So what about others on the call? And feel free to just speak up. I see Margaret is typing. A few people are typing. Would anybody like to um, speak over the phone? <laughs> hmm. Well, I'll continue speaking and you continue to typing. That's a fair deal. But please feel free to interject anytime you want. Um, we have a few people, a number of people typing right now. So I'll just wait a couple of seconds for folks to get their information in. And thank you for taking the time to do it. Community referrals, 85%. DOH, 40%. Wow, Margaret. OK, 
Kathy, in the month of June, 70 percent uh, was engaging patients at the hospital. So that direct engagement at the hospital is working quite well. 85 percent, Marguerite, I'd love to hear how that, how you're doing that. That's amazing. Perhaps when you fill out your um, health home care management supervisor information, we'll get some ideas. And please feel free to speak up now. Okay, I think we'll get moving forward. Um, I understand a lot of people are typing, but we will have that information and we can go back and look at it. So, so again, and here's something we hear quite frequently, the DOH list is still the biggest struggle. Um, locating and explaining how the program uh, can benefit for folks who are on the list has been uh, difficult finding them um, and then having them understand why somebody is visiting them um, out of the blue from their perspective. Okay, so community referrals are going easier. So one of the things that we reviewed in our face-to-face -face with the PAM, the patient activation measure. Um, some of you may have seen this. Some of you may not have seen this at all yet. Um, and others may actually be using it. So what I'd like to do is focus on the concepts in it, the idea of it, uh, rather than the instrument itself, although uh, certainly uh, those who are already using it will have a, a good knowledge of that. Um, there is also, I will mention, a very good YouTube uh, video on patient activation measure that if you just put in patient activation measure, you'll be able to pull up uh, where it's described by the originators of it and, and done very well um, and interestingly so that it holds your attention. So this is a tool to assess the knowledge, skills, and confidence essential to managing one's own health and health care. This is crucial um, and has always been crucial for folks. The only person that can help us be healthy is ourselves. And uh, our taking that um, uh, responsibility, having the confidence to do it, um, having it uh, something that we focus on on a daily basis is the thing that will really make a difference for any of us in our health. So that's where the patient activation measure came. Um, and one of the interesting things when I did watch the video and when I've worked with this um, in the past is that once people start to move with that, once they start to make one change, they tend to make a number of changes. So there's something very powerful about people starting to take hold of their own health care, realizing it's going to be something they're going to do um, if things are going to change for them. So um, I, I want you to uh, think about it in that broader kind of way. So even those who don't have the patient activation measure yet or, and aren't using it yet can actually use the principles of it and think about it that way. I, I think one of the areas where it's the biggest change is that um, in traditional care management, with less of an emphasis on the person becoming responsible and independent with their own care and, and a little more attention on maybe doing for them or uh, trying to fix it or those kinds of things where the provider was taking the responsibility. So what is this? Coaching for activation principles. Active and reflective listening skills with particular attention to listening. And I would add uh, something I added since we did the face-to-face, -face, seeking the individual's ideas and solutions. So if, if I, from my, and as you, many of you know, I, I do motivational interviewing, so it's coming from that um, way of working with people. The, the two strongest things there are that listening, active listening to people so that we can really understand. And then rather than giving solutions to people, giving ideas to people, seeking from them what their ideas and their solutions are. And it doesn't mean we can't give suggestions. We can give a menu of options to people, and still then it will sit in their court. What makes sense to me? 
what would be possible for me? Uh, where might I go with this? So that active and reflective listening is particularly important. Spending more time reflecting what you hear rather than asking or telling. Different way of saying it, um, but whenever I work with folks on these kinds of conversations, it's much easier to fall into questioning again than it is to build some skills around reflecting. Um, and I would say that anything that we talk about with activation for the consumers, for the people we work with, um, I, might, I might say we also do with our um, staff that we supervise. So we as supervisors can use the exact same skills with our staff that help them build the skills that they'll need to work with the people they're serving. Understanding and focusing on that person's agenda. Um, after all, uh, if they're not on board with us, it's, it's really not a goal at all. Uh, we're not going anywhere down that road of change. So we need to understand what it is that's important to them, what are their values, uh, what is it that would motivate them to make a change in their life. Um, you know, one of the examples I give is when folks are talking about tobacco use with a very young person, a young woman, let's say, 19, 20 year old, if you're talking about health consequences of tobacco with somebody, they're not likely to hear you. Because at that point in their life, that's not usually one of their high values. Um, but maybe um, exposure of their children to smoke or, or perhaps even something is uh, um, what some might consider not such an important value, their beauty, their skin, how they look, um, that might be the thing that's most valuable to them. And I think that's sometimes the hardest thing for us as providers um, to work with because most of us will tend to see change being important because of our values, our personal values. And of course, it is important to us if we're making the change, but to someone else it might not be at all. It will be their values that will drive their change. And supporting the individual's own problem-solving skills. And that really goes back to what I said about seeking the individual's ideas and solutions. They have them. They know them. They'll tell them to us if we ask them and we, and we pull that out from them. So let's move on. Supporting them um, in, with ways to reduce their stress response and increase their resilience. Uh, with the population we serve with multiple health problems, social problems, um, the issues that they come to us in health homes. Many of them have very uh, strong histories of trauma. And folks with trauma have a very right stress response, and rightfully so. They've survived, and that's amazing in itself. But it's learning how to cope with that overactive stress response and how to be able to build the resilience that will really help them in their overall health care. When the body is in that constant stress response, it's causing harm. And this is part of the reason why folks do not live as long, um, that uh, they get more illnesses. It's that constant stress in their, in their body. So it is such a gift. Um, it's a gift for us. It's a gift for the people we serve to be able to learn how to uh, manage that stress response and how to build our resilience. Affirming individuals to enhance their self-efficacy and capacity. The only way I can know whether I'm doing well is to hear about something I'm doing in a very behavioral way that says to me, wow, this person thinks I really know how to do this. They really see value in how I'm doing this. Um, and for many of the people we serve, they haven't heard that very often. So that ability to affirm people for their self-efficacy and their capacity, uh, their abilities, is, is going to be very, very important. And then the activation thing, the whole idea of getting them to engage in their own health and health care by restoring their power 
to take an active role. And I chose to take out the word empower. I don't use it anymore. Um, people always had their power. They just didn't know. And we don't give, we don't empower them like as if they never had it and here you go, you've got your power. We get out of the way and we find ways of working with them so that they can find that power again and begin to use it. Uh, and in that, the activation happens. When people start to see that when I do this, this happens, they become more motivated to take a hold of their health care and do something about it. And finally, and maybe even most importantly, hold the hope for them. Believe that something different can happen. Believe that change is possible. Uh, believe in them. Uh, believe in their abilities uh, to do what it is that uh, would be helpful to them with their own health care. So, a question. How do you work with your staff now on considering a person's current activation level? And I will say for those of you who are not using the PAM or, or even using the language from the PAM, how are you assisting your staff in understanding where people are in their readiness to change and how to help them move forward with that? Um, to become more active in their health care. What's going on out there right now? Can I ask you to either speak up on the phone or type uh, your response? Thank you for calling Joanio, the Hudson Valley's premier provider of lifespan services for children and adults with special needs. You can also visit us at Jowani. Well, that was interesting. Kathy is typing, so we'll wait. Thank you so much, Kathy, for considering this question. Staff need to be educated on stages of change and also have to focus on meeting the client where they're at and not trying to move them forward until they're ready. Um, yes, very powerful stuff. Uh, it, 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 if we don't know where the person is in their readiness to change, uh, we could very well um, move into a place that they're not ready and, and in doing that, people actually move backwards and further away from their change. So understanding a person is still in early, early contemplation, um, we wouldn't be doing the things that would be um, trying to like make a plan, uh, decide how this change is going to happen. We're really working on building a foundation for why this would even be important. So our first question might even be, what makes this so important to you right now? Uh, what would make this something that you would want to do? Uh, what are the top three reasons? How confident are you? Those kinds of questions are extremely helpful when people are in that contemplation stage. Um, over the years, and when I've worked with the motivational interviewing, that's one of the things that I notice the most is that folks, they'll move from contemplation to planning before the person has even made the commitment to do this. And, and that, in many ways, can be counterproductive and actually push people backwards. Uh, one of the things we notice is that when we start to tell people about what they might do to make that change when they're still in contemplation, they'll start to tell you all the reasons why they can't, everything that gets in the way. Um, I call that sustained talk, and sustained talk actually is the person convincing themselves not to change. So as little of that as we can do, uh, helpful to the individual to open up the door for the possible change in the future. So 
So that, that does require some patience, um, being willing to go at the speed that the person is able to go and willing to go. Okay, let's move forward from that. We could have that screen back up. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move to the next slide. Level one in the PAM, patients tend to be overwhelmed and unprepared to play an active role in their health. I might add, uh, at that point in time in their life, it might not be the most important thing to them. Uh, there may be many other competing things that are much more important in their minds. Um, and that will be something important for us to figure out by listening to them and understanding what they are really caring about. Level two, they lack the knowledge and confidence, so that's a confidence builder level really. Um, I believe I can do this, I have all the tools I need to do this, um, and, and I'm going to do this. Level three, people are beginning to take action, but still building confidence and skill. Much like us with learning a new intervention, um, when we first start it, we don't, we're not really sure if it's going to work. Uh, we don't always uh, understand what to expect or how it's going to look, uh, what the outcome might be. And so um, that practice, that ongoing work of doing it over and over again helps build that skill and feeling that we're going to be successful. And in level four, people have adopted many of the behaviors to support their health but may not be able to maintain them in the face of life stressors. This is where I like to talk about us too. Um, the people we serve are us and when we talked about our own wellness, um, this is true for all of us. That there is a level of stress, there can be a level of things that happen where we're not able to do this either. Um, and that's why it's so important you're in a, a role where you have that opportunity to to see what's going on for your care managers to be able to monitor that and notice if there's folks who are really feeling the life stressors that are so great um, that their ability to carry on and do the things that are best for themselves is, is really limited. So uh, obviously, and for ourselves as well, we want to do that. So the next area that we talked about um, was understanding complex needs. <coughs> ask the first question, and if anybody wants to speak on the phone, by all means, although I'm understanding there may not be too many folks who are on the phone, but what are the complex needs and concerns of the clients you're serving? So yeah. what are the things that um, really uh, you're coming across on an ongoing basis that your care managers are bringing to you regarding complex needs? We have a couple of folks typing now. Housing resources, so locating housing for folks. Homelessness again, substance use, and medical issues. many people typing right now. Housing again, um, lack of affordable housing and safe housing. Substance use again, um, mental health referrals. I'm assuming, Frank, that that has to do with the length of time it takes or the difficulty of finding uh, programs that you can uh, access quickly. Um, navigating DS DSS and Social Security. Housing again in capital, clearly housing uh, and again. So can I ask you, that is an area that many of you have brought up as hugely concerning. Is there anyone on the call that's having some success with this? And if you are, what, how is that going for you? Is there anyone that can give us some um, wisdom about something that's going well there? And if, you know, if there's some who have an idea of what would be necessary, what would help with this, um, 
how do you see this happening, an improvement in this arena of housing, even if you don't have it yet? We have uh, some folks typing right now. While we're waiting, I'll mention a something that happened here locally a few years ago and is being worked on again. Um, one of the things that locally uh, was done was a uh, connection with landlords. They had a large landlord breakfast where a number of landlords were brought in, um, given a breakfast, uh, given information, care managers came and spoke with them, others from the uh, behavioral health came and spoke, uh, and, and build, trying to build those strong relationships with landlords. I believe we had uh, between 75 and 80 landlords show up. Um, and that's being revitalized again in, in the community, um, recognized as one of the crucial things, a uh, strong relationship with the landlords that are out there. Um, I see we also have problems with mental health hospitalizations being acute. Consumers are being hospitalized for a few days and it seems discharge has more focus than the treatment. So am I understanding, Michelle, what you're saying is that um, people are getting into the hospital and there isn't too much in the way of treatment happening. Most of it is how can we move them out and um, find a place for them? And Michelle is answering, yes, okay. Yes, I actually had that experience uh, myself with someone that was in the psych unit and, and the staff person said, well, we don't do treatment here. <laughs> and I, I smiled at that. I'm not sure what that means. So. Um, yeah, so um, it really is a temporary housing for an issue that we already have an issue for, about, right? There's no housing for this person. They spend a few days there, nothing's happening around their psychiatric piece, and, and they're discharged and we're still in the same position that we were in. So um, I gave one idea of the landlords and um, building relationships there, and uh, I, I, we even were going to do a follow-up with that where we'd bring them back in a year or so and uh, recognize some of the landlords that had done an outstanding job and really worked with us well and provided uh, safe and clean uh, housing for the folks that we were serving. So that's just another idea uh, that may work down the road. Um, since no one else is typing, I'm just in interested also in the substance use piece of it. Um, what are folks finding with the substance use that, that is working? And uh, what do you still need around that piece of it? And we have someone typing. Um, in need of Suboxone providers, yes countrywide, um, not just a local issue. Uh, and I believe that a lot of things are happening right now federally that could be helpful with this increase in number of patients. Also, a big push towards getting nurse practitioners to be able to um, prescribe. Uh, so let's all root for that because that certainly will be helpful. Anything else? Okay. It is a difficult thing, um, understanding that people may not be at a place where they're willing to stop using, and yet how can we support them? How can we guide them while they're still in that active stage? How can we find housing for them? All of the things that are really challenging around that. How about the medical issues? Um, who's finding that their staff are getting very comfortable with that, and, and how is that happening? 
what is it that's allowing them to feel more confident with that and um, the relationships they're building? Kathy is typing. Michelle, a few others. It seems to be something similar to the housing, these relationships that we build in the community. Um, how do we do that? number of people are typing right now. Kathy, um, I think that the CMs that are working with clients that also have public health included in their care are much more comfortable. Okay, so they have somebody who, uh, perhaps a nurse or somebody who can, uh, has that expertise and so they can allow the care managers to focus on the social issues. And of course, um, the goal of care management in this health home is that we connect the clients to the folks who can provide the service that they need. So, uh, you know, ultimately we would want them to have the medical services that they needed to be healthy, um, you know, the social services they needed to be healthy in a social manner, and also the uh, mental health services. So that's good. That's really what we're looking for. They're, uh, following through the way that uh, seems to be mer merited. Um, we've inherited mainly men mental, I'm not sure, um, okay, I'm not sure if they mean mental illness or what MI means. Uh, you know what it means to me, motivational interviewing. Um, we've inherited MI and it's not too different dealing with medical issues they have. Uh, hard time dealing with just medical. Okay, so what you're telling me is you primarily have folks with behavioral health, um, but some of them have the medical issues as well, where it's more difficult is when they just have the medical, because um, it seems that they, to the person, that they don't need the services um, that you offer. Um, so how are you dealing with that, Michelle? What are you doing um, with the medical-only folks to help them um, engage. Are there things you're actively doing as a team? Staff is having a hard time. And we're waiting for a couple of folks who are typing. Because we have an increased number of folks with medical issues, staff have been forced to learn. We also have a nurse who's a CM. Wow. Great. So the team has an asset. They have someone they can call to get an understanding of what's going on. And put in the place where they're getting a number of clients with this issue, um, they're responding to that need and figuring it out and learning for themselves. The consumers don't seem needy enough, okay? That maybe they're taking care of their own health. Uh, although if they're on the list, one would presume that there's a uh, reason for that, uh, that somebody felt they needed some support around that. Um, I'm wondering what that is, Michelle. Yeah, it's interesting. We won't have time today to do that, but it would be interesting to know how um, that different view is there of um, the perhaps medical staff who think they need the help, perhaps their primary care doctor or somebody like that, or the emergency room, and then the person themselves. Very interesting. I do get called in on that uh, quite frequently into doctors' offices, uh, uh, and sometimes uh, 
the person is not doing everything that they're being asked to do. Um, and when you sit and talk with them and really listen, you find out a lot about why they aren't. Um, and we've been able to solve some of those issues. So uh, I guess that communication with the medical team is really important because they may have a view of it that's unrealistic as well. Um, staff is used to dealing with very needy consumers. They almost do not know what to do with higher functioning consumers. You know, my one smile I've had about the PAM, the patient activation measure, is I'm wondering how the staff who provide services, medical staff, uh, nurses, doctors, um, and others will respond to that because when you've been used to being the one directing and telling people what to do and expecting this word that they always use, compliance, and all of a sudden people are taking hold of their own health and they've got their own ideas about how this is going to go, it's interesting to think about how staff might respond to that because in some ways it's threatening, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, what do we do with these higher functioning folks that really have ideas about how things should go and, and know something about their health and would like it to go a certain way? Um, and very likely those skills of really listening and in, in evoking from them what they would like to see, is there anything that you could be helped with, anything that would be, uh, could offer guidance for you or support, um, and having them tell us would probably be the best approach. Okay, let's move on. So if we could have the, um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Essential components of supervision. Um, and this is where we spend a lot of time at the face-to-face. -face. We broke these down into individual components of supervision, and folks uh, develop plans of how they do that. So let's see how we can do that um, over the uh, webinar. Uh, to be able to um, get some information that will be useful to each other and, and how it's working for you right now. So case presentation, we'll talk about that. Um, skills training, including modeling and coaching. Um, group supervision, field mentoring, and database supervision. So those are the things to start thinking about as we go forward with this. Um, saying, uh, Peter Senj, people don't resist change. They resist being changed, and uh, that's true for us. That's true for the supervisees. That's true for the people we serve. So essential components of supervision, what's working and what can we try. Um, we'll share those responses um, so that we can learn from each other, as I mentioned before. So let's talk about case presentation. Are you using any particular format for case presentations on your team? That would be important to know. Is there a way that you do that that's working really well for you? How competent are your staff in preparing the presentations? And if they aren't yet there, what do you think you need to help build that confidence for them? Um, and I think we'll stop there uh, as far as case, case presentation at this point. So who's using it? Do you have a particular format? If not, um, how competent are your staff and how, how well is that going? Lynn is typing. Well, while Liz is typing, I might just mention a couple of things that were brought up at the face-to-face -face that I had taken with me and brought back. Um, folks had said things like using a sense of humor was very important, normalizing mistakes, um, understanding that none of us are perfect and that things don't always go the best way, um, recognizing the strengths of the people that are supervisees and then providing affirmations to them, much as we would like to see them do with the people they serve. Um, Liz is still typing.
Frank is typing. Again, feel free to speak up on the phone if you have that access. Okay, Liz, we meet weekly and discuss on a regular basis any client who the care manager may be having issues with. We also encourage care managers to make a presentation to the staff on a specific client. We may know ahead of time specifics and may have answers ready. We encourage all the CMs to share. Okay, so uh, weekly you're discussing the folks that um, care managers are, have challenges with. Um, you're encouraging them to make get presentations on specific clients and you um, sometimes already have some ideas about uh, things that might be helpful and, and continue to encourage everyone to share. Um, does anybody, by the way, uh, have uh, presentations where the client is there as well? Just so. And another thing that I'm thinking about while we're, and I'll read Frank's response, uh, that I'm thinking about is uh, the language that we use to describe the folks and um, to describe the challenges we have. And um, does it have that hopeful tone to it? Uh, is it an effort for you as a supervisor to keep it in that mode of um, positive problem solving versus uh, you know, um, words that are stigmatizing and, and perhaps uh, not helpful. So Frank says, in our agency we just implemented a form to utilize. Would that be something folks can, and I don't know if you've gotten that far, but is that something you might be able to share with folks, Frank? Um, that was one thing that we did uh, at the face-to-face. -face. I'm hopeful that this will be a productive guide for staff to utilize when presenting concerns. Uh, weekly team meetings where we share concerns in an open forum, so much like uh, Liz's response. And Marguerite is uh, uh, typing. It seems from your responses that some support for staff in understanding how to present a case, perhaps even more importantly, and how to present it in that more hopeful, uh, less stigmatizing uh, way is important. One of the things we used to say when I did case presentation on our inpatient rehab that I was the manager was if the patient can't sit and listen to it, then we probably need to change how we've presented it. Um, Frank, in our agency, we just implemented a, oh, Frank, sorry, Margaret, we have bi-weekly group case conference, bi-weekly meaning I'm, I'm guessing every other week, um, and individual case conferencing two to three times uh, a month. Uh, it'd be great if Frank could share his new format, yeah. Anything that folks have taken the time to develop, um, great opportunity for the rest of us. And thank you for your expertise and the hard work that went into it, Frank. Uh, hopefully that's something you feel comfortable sharing. Okay, can we move on? <clears throat> Frank, thank you. I think Frank is going to answer, so we'll let Frank do that answer and we'll move on to the next one. Um, so, when you think about your case presentations with folks, and this is talking about using the PAM, but let's think in that broader way. Are we thinking about where the person is in their activation? Are we thinking about where the person is in their stages of readiness to change? Um, would you consider making that a routine part of supervisory practice if it's not already there? So, 
Um, are folks talking about this? Are they talking about that person's level of activation, their readiness to change in our supervision, in our case presentation that we're doing now? Thank you, Frank. I see that you can't take credit for it, but um, we will give you credit for sharing with us and letting us know what you know, um, and, and thank you for seeing what you can do. Margaret is uh, typing, guarding the PAM, the stages of readiness for change, and how important that is in your case presentations right now. Okay, we'll wait for Margaret, and then we'll move on to the next slide to get that response. Oh, we've got others typing now, so check that out. as far as we get today, by the way, folks. We'll give you access to the PowerPoint. Um, it's more important to get the information that you're sharing. We'd love to use the PAM, but we've not found a funding source yet. We're looking at studying what is available and incorporating. Yeah. So um, understanding those levels, understanding stages of readiness for change and what kinds of interventions work. Um, yeah, I, I cannot answer the NIAPR uh, question, but hopefully uh, Ruth can. Um, yeah, I'm here. Um, can you hear yeah. me? Okay, great. Um, we, since PAM is a proprietary document, we don't have it and we don't unfortunately train on it. So we were including a, a lot of the information during our first webinar um, in this project on the PAM because we really do believe that PAM is a wonderful tool. And we also think that it's going to be part of the DISCRIP and that um, yeah. health homes will be purchasing them directly. And so it is hopeful that this will filter down directly to the care management team. Yeah. Okay. And it is being used in other areas too, Ruth. I know it's being used with a number of the federal grants that people have. Um, it's uh, being used with Nurse Family Partnership has it. I, or, and um, one of our Finger Lakes group with the have care managers in primary care offices, they're using it. So I know it's being used by quite a few folks that are using federal grant money. Okay, so let's move forward. Uh, and let me just go back to that again. I think it's very important to understand that that whole idea of activating people is something we can do whether we have the PAM or not. Because it's a way of being with people. It's about how do we encourage them to be able to find their own answers and uh, do the things that are most important to them that they can build confidence in. Um, and we can do that uh, while we're waiting to see what can happen with the PAM. Um, so skills training. Um, let's see, we have only, um, I think, 20 minutes and we've gone about halfway. So let's see which parts of these might be most important. Um, let's ask this question because some of you may be doing this on a regular basis. Uh, is anybody doing skills training coaching practice with care managers right now? And if you are or if you'd like to, what skills do you think are most critical for your health home care managers that they don't already have? Uh, you know, pretty effectively right now.
Um, I
I don't see anyone typing at this point. We'll give it a couple of seconds. But one thing I will share um, that could be important, um, sorry about this. Um, I just lost my connection. Yeah. Uh, there. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Our connection was taken off for a moment. We're in the process of moving here, and there's been some challenges, um, but we're back together. Uh, so one of the things we know that, that we learned, um, and I see Liz has responded, communication, both written and verbal, so important. Um, if it's all right with all of you, I'll share something that uh, we've learned through motivational interviewing. Um, no matter how much training we did with motivational interviewing with folks, um, even those who are trainers themselves, unless people had um, ongoing um, support and coaching and opportunities to practice with feedback, it, it, it tends to not get imp any improvement in the uh, level of skill with motivational interviewing. But we found that with all training. Uh, when people can hear the information, they can understand the information, they can know the information, but to get uh, effective in using it, a skill, it, it requires this kind of interaction. So I, I agree with you. One of the things that I did in one of the trainings recently was to have triads sit down and have one person act in the role of the care manager, one person act in the role of the person they were serving, and the other person as a supervisor watching. And I asked the person that was acting as the person being served to use a real change that they were thinking of doing. So it wasn't um, role play in the sense that it was uh, not real. It was real role play in the fact that the person really wanted to make this change and the care manager was having that conversation with them. And after they had the conversation, we had the supervisor then um, give feedback to the care manager about uh, what they did really well and where there might have been some small opportunity for enhancement of that conversation that might have helped, uh, uh, you know, create a better opportunity for the person for their change. Um, the other thing we did, though, after that was to then have them write a progress note and uh, a, tr a recovery plan based on what the person had said. Um, and that piece was really valuable to start to see that people really do have the skill and, and know when it's given in that way and they get to practice, they can actually incorporate that stuff into their notes and do a really good job. So thank you, Liz. Communication, absolutely, because communication is the, also the relational thing, isn't it? That's the piece. That's how we have relationships is with our communication. It becomes the most important thing we do. And we have Rhonda typing. So I'll just wait for that, and then we'll move on. You'll notice that part two in the face-to-face -face was we asked each one of the um, uh, supervisors to choose a skill that you'd like to build on your team, and then to build a, a plan of how you would do that. Um, and so each one of the supervisors came up with a plan of how they would work with their team. Uh, to nurture the skill that was most important to them at that time. Communication, oh, glad we still got that one, so I'm not sure where the next message is or if it's there yet. Okay, time management is a critical skill to have and to schedule to see their clients and paperwork. Um, yeah, I also believe in debriefing when I uh, in a meeting with them to see how they think the meeting went and any other suggestions needed. Yeah, so you're giving them a voice, um, trying to work with them around this time management thing. How can I get everything done that I feel I need to get done, uh, both the direct uh, work with my clients and the paperwork, um, but also this place where you're really listening to them to hear how are things going for you and what else do you think that you need. Uh, which is really more role modeling for them, what we would like to see them do with the people they're serving as well. Okay, let's move on. And thank you so much, Rhonda. Carol, can I interrupt a moment? This is Ruth. You can as much as you like. 
Okay. I just wanted to uh, publicly thank Frank. He actually did what he promised, and he sent me the case presentation form that was created by his organization. I was able to already upset, load, upload that into your uh, resource file box up here on the right-hand side. And so those of you who expressed interest in it, you can just go right there and download it for yourself. Thank you so much, Frank. Wow. That's really wonderful. My thanks. Yeah, my thanks too, Frank. Really, this is a, a model of what we would like to see happen in this learning that we're all doing together. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, so let's move on uh, to group supervision. Um, I think um, with this one, we're just, uh, I will not do the exercise because, as I said, there's only about 17 minutes left. Um, so just to think about, and uh, we asked the groups in the face-to-face -face how often you're meeting, what topics you're discussing, what's working well, and are there any challenges in group supervision. So because there's a lot of overlap with this and and case uh, presentation. I think we'll just move from this on to the next session. Um, thank you. So this one I think is important. Um, you've just received a memo that your team needs to do X, Y, and Z. You can come up with it, whatever you like, um, in your mind. If there's something new that you know is coming for your team right now, um, put that in that space. Something that's real to you as a supervisor. And then we asked them, and by the way, that was back a few months ago, so it won't be August 1st. Let's pretend it's October 1st now. That gives some time for you. Um, you don't really know much about this, whatever it is, and you anticipate that your team's going to have some significant reaction to it. The question is, the important question is, how are you going to bring this to your team? Um, what are you going to do? To, to start this out in a way that has possibility and hope and uh, a positive, uh, you know, kind of outcome versus uh, beginning that process of, you know, how it goes. Oh, not this again. We have to change again. Uh, that kind of a response. So what are you going to do as a supervisor to have that other response from your team? And, and how do you deal with your own stuff in your response to this? Because you're also having to deal with this change coming up. And I don't see anyone responding at this point in time. Anybody want to speak on the phone or uh, anybody have any experience with this or thoughts about it? Rhonda's typing, so we'll wait for Rhonda's response and then we'll move on. You know, how we present things to each other, including those relationships we're trying to build in the community uh, with physicians, with uh, landlords, with hospitals, uh, how we approach it, that way that we introduce it to people uh, really makes a difference. Um, and I've heard a lot of teams saying that when I offer to the other person the things that I can bring to this, uh, I get a very different response than when I, I'm asking, I have an ask about something versus an offer of what I can bring. And we'll just wait. Liz is also typing. Our 
I want to thank all of those, all of you, uh, for your participation and your expertise. To um, it's been very helpful because this is not a, the easiest format to do this kind of active stuff with. So we explain the reasons behind the need for the change. Oftentimes, staff is very receptive. So clearly, whatever Liz is doing in her explanation to folks, um, it's effective. Um, it, she, they feel supported. They feel that it's important. Um, they feel like it's something that they can build skill with. So, Liz, kudos to you. Whatever you're doing must be bringing that to them. And we'll just wait for Rhonda, and then we'll move on. Okay, I believe that honesty is the best policy. Yes, I would deliver the message to my team in a positive manner and offer as much information as I can. Uh, yeah, so absolutely, the transparency is important. Um, and as you've mentioned, Rhonda, there is a way to do it that is, has a more positive spin. Um, and that's just taking out the strengths and giving them to people versus uh, focusing on the possible uh, issues um, as a, as a you know, way of opening to this, because this is the same thing that we would want to do with the people we serve. Um, we don't change or things don't happen when we hear things it, it, with a negative spin. Um, it just sets off a dynamic that uh, makes it, uh, takes away people's motivation and uh, isn't helpful. So thank you so much, Rhonda. Can we move on? back to the screen. Thank you so much. Okay. So um, field mentoring, I'm not going to do this, have these questions answered, but um, this is something where um, seeing what's going on directly is really, really helpful to understand what staff are doing. Um, when we've looked at people reporting how they've done their work versus actually watching it, we find that very often there isn't a, a strong connection of what people think they're doing and what they're actually doing. So it's very helpful to be able to see people active in their work. Um, one of the questions that we had people answer at the face-to-face -face was having them create a do this, don't do that manual. Uh, although I would focus uh, having uh, a preference for the more uh, positive do this, um, I would focus on, on that if I was putting one together. Um, the next thing is use of data. Um, and so I'm, I'm expecting that a lot of you currently have access to some data. And, uh, and the question we asked everybody was, are you looking at it on a regular basis? Are you sharing it with your staff? And um, is there other data you wish you had? So I'm going to leave that one with you as well. Um, something to think about. Uh, it can be very, very helpful to understand where there's needs, um, where there's possibilities to make things work better. So cultural activation, that was one of the webinars we had. Um, what does it do for us? It improves our therapeutic encounter because whenever we can fully understand the person in front of us as best make that attempt to understand them as best we can, which again, we go back to the really listening to people and having things understood from their perspective, um, we're going to have a you know, better outcome with our relationship. Enhances the likelihood of greater engagement and retention in care. Um, allows care choices to be made that are more appropriate. So many of us bring with our culture ways of doing things that may be different than other cultures. And uh, there's always a, an opportunity to bring those things into the care that people are offered um, so that there's comfort and uh, recognition of something that is uh, familiar to them. Um, allows recovery plans to be developed that are better attuned to the cultural identity needs, absolutely. Um, so one of the tools that we gave you was the cultural activation prompt. Um, that's the list of 14 cues for consumers to use to convey information to caregivers on what culturally matters to them in receiving care. Um, it's a lovely tool to help us ensure that we do that listening and that we go beyond um, our own understanding and into the understanding that somebody else has of what's happening to them, 
what they would like to see happen to them, how they would like their care to progress. And there they are. We uh, don't need to go through all of them, um, but some of them say how you would like to be called. It is always the person's call as to how they are viewed by others. Um, I may choose to say I'm a Canadian immigrant or I may choose to say I'm a resident alien in the United States. I may choose to say I'm English heritage or I may choose to say I'm Canadian. So it, it's my choice to decide who I am, not someone else to put that label on me. Um, my cultural identity, um, but most importantly when we get down to the things about how, how is my illness viewed by others in my group? Um, what do they call it and how, what kind of things would they say about the treatment that I'm getting? Those things are so important to understand how, what a person is feeling, what they're going through in all of this process and what they need from us. So an excellent resource for learning about it is there for the taking and we'll move on to that. So. Um, Again, we have seven minutes, so I'm going to move forward, but I would ask that you think about these things. Are your teams, uh, are there ways that you could use this with your health home clients? And perhaps some of you already are. Um, and are these issues getting discussed in supervision? And how do we support folks around that? Um, there's a uh, one of the other handouts that you have, which is the stages of change. Um, you'll have that available to you. Where it's very important and helpful is in the ideas of how you can move forward with this. Um, what are the kinds of things that we can do as care managers to help a person who's in pre-contemplation? What are the things we can do when they're in preparation? Um, what are the things that will help that person make that change? So hopefully this um, handout will be something that's helpful as you do those discussions, uh, have those discussions uh, related also to the PAM about where people are in their readiness to change and to take care of themselves. Um, and we were given that uh, when we were uh, had the uh, webinar on the SCARF model. So let's just talk a little bit about that. Um, it was presented to us that the SCARF is uh, words that work approach to communication, using words that will move people towards a desired outcome and away from a threat response. It very much addresses that trauma issue as well um, and, and just that general uh, desire by people to maintain who they are. So in many ways it's speaking to the cultural piece too that ability to use words to, to, to do not threaten people's view of who they are as a person and do not threaten them from a perspective of bringing up their trauma uh, response. It's a way to choose and use words that are motivational rather than threatening. Um, and you'll see that uh, cute little picture on the bottom there that demonstrates that. So status refers to one sense of importance in relation to others. So whenever we're in a relationship where we feel that we're less important, um, it's going to be difficult to build that kind of trusting, caring, respect that we've all talked about. Um, to have a sense that you are as important as the other person, um, certainly important when you're the one being served. Um, certainty refers to one's need for understanding, clarity, and ability to make accurate, predict, pred accurate predictions. So as someone mentioned earlier, giving people as much information as honestly as we can um, so that they can make their own decisions and, and get a sense that they understand what's going to be happening. Um, unknown is scary for folks. Um, and the more that we can uh, smooth that over, the better. Autonomy has uh, always been one of the most important things from my perspective. This understanding that people have control over their events, uh, perception that you, what you do makes a, a difference, that you can actually make things work better. And we want to use that kind of language with folks so that that builds their sense of autonomy, that self-efficacy, that belief that they can have an impact. Relatedness, again, the number one thing. Um, our connection to and security with other person, a belief that that person really cares about us, um, that they have compassion for us, 
um, that, that our, our needs are primary to them at this point when, we're, when they're the person that's serving us. Um, and fairness uh, to that just and non-biased exchange between people so that we believe that we're all kind of getting the same opportunities. So um, we shall move on to next steps and I want to thank everybody for your participation today. Um, thank you ever so much. It's challenging in a webinar, um, but everybody has stepped forward and offered their um, expertise and also, again, another thanks for that tool that we were given. So thank you so much. I look forward to seeing everybody at our face-to-face, -face, I believe in March, um, and to being on the future webinars.